So the trailer for Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey 2 recently dropped, which of course is a sequel to the hit 2023 film Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey. With a score of 3% on Rotten Tomatoes and being considered the worst film of 2023 by Variety, Rolling Stone and Metacritic, you might be surprised to hear that this film is getting a sequel. But it was profitable enough not just for one sequel, but a whole proposed cinematic universe revolving around children's characters. In an age where more than ever reviews can kill films, this is absolutely remarkable. Remarkable. This Winnie the Pooh horror film was created as a response to Winnie the Pooh entering public domain in 2022. Notably this year, 2024, Mickey Mouse has entered public domain. And on the 1st of January, not only was a Mickey Mouse horror film announced, but also a Mickey Mouse horror game. And then on the 2nd of January, another Mickey Mouse horror film was announced. And then since then, a third different person has announced a horror film. So why? Is this lazy writing? Are we going to be seeing a similar thing with every children's movie character? forever. Well, let's talk about that. I'm Todd Boyer, and I recently watched a bunch of really bad horror films based around characters that were originally made for children. Now, we can't talk much about any of these Mickey Mouse films yet. They're not out yet. But just going off the trailer, this looks like one of the worst freaking films that I've ever seen in my life. I could not fathom a worse looking film. I'll be right back. And he's dead. Like if he was in a horror movie, you'd never say, I'll be right back. Because then you don't. Did they think they were original with this line? Why would they put this in the trailer? Similar to Blood and Honey, it, it looks like they've just gotten a cheap mask from a costume shop and then called it a day. Somehow they've made it look much worse. And I should know because that is one of the films I watched for this video, along with a couple of other ones which are, are based around some surprising characters. But before we talk about these films, we need to talk about why this is happening now, which means we need to talk about what public domain is. All works that are created and published within the United States are protected by copyright laws. So the characters and the works themselves can be protected and owned by a person or entity. However, after 95 years, those those works and characters become free to use to anyone. And that's what we call public domain. It wasn't always 95 years though, it used to be 56 years. The idea behind these laws is that after 56 years, whoever created the works would probably be dead and therefore didn't need money anymore. But their work would be able to live on through the people. However, sometime in the 80s, uh, Mickey Mouse was about to go into public domain. So Disney kind of headlined this push in Congress to extend this time period so they could hold on to the rights to Mickey Mouse and all their other characters. But that's why Mickey Mouse entering public domain this year is so significant. And considering so many Disney's best works are based around public domain properties, such as Jungle Book, Tarzan, Hunchback of Notre Dame, Mulan, Her Hercules, Frozen, Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Cinderella, Snow White, and, and so many more. It feels very hypocritical of them to do this, uh, but yeah, whatever. Other notable characters that are in the public domain include Sherlock Holmes, Robin Hood, Frankenstein's monster, uh, characters from the book version of Wizard of Oz, even technically King Kong is public domain. But theoretically, anyone can use these characters now for their own works. It's the reason we got three films based around Pinocchio in 2022. Thankfully, none of those were horror films, but one of them was a horrific film. And then another one was just a bad film. And then the other one I heard was good. I haven't watched it yet. But regarding characters like Winnie the Pooh and Mickey Mouse, it is notable that you can't use their more iconic appearances. Those are still under copyright law. You have to use the original depictions of them. So for Mickey Mouse, it's got to be the Steamboat Willie version of Mickey Mouse. For Winnie the Pooh, it's got to be the original drawings. You can't use the more modern ones because they are still owned by Disney. But even though we can use all these characters in so many different ways any way we want, why so often do people choose to make horror films with the characters. In 2030, we might see an evil version of Donald Duck hitting the screens when he becomes public domain. Could you imagine in 2034 when we see an evil version of Superman? I couldn't even imagine what that looks like. Now, while I mentioned earlier in the video that Blood and Honey was a profitable film, it's actually only the third most profitable bear-based horror film of 2023. In second place was Cocaine Bear, and of course, in first place was Five Nights at Freddy's. Interestingly, Five Nights at Freddy's actually plays on a similar concept being that it's something made for children made scary. Five Nights at Freddy's is kind of inspired by the Chuck E. Cheese animatronics at the family chain restaurant in America. Something I would just love to have in Australia. I think we need more animatronics here of 
of anything. I think we got like one bunyip under a bridge somewhere and that's like our only animatronic. But in Chuck E. Cheese, the animatronics are made to appeal to children and in that way Five Nights at Freddy's is playing off the same tropes. I don't think FNAF in any way is made for children but something about it definitely appeals to a younger audience. This is similar to other video games like Poppy Playtime which is another game series that I know, you know, next to nothing about. But yet somehow I still see everywhere I go. A big element of this has to do with how young people interact with horror as a genre. Playing with these tropes of children's media makes it more accessible. Young people have also always had a fascination with darker content. And this can range, you know, think of Scooby-Doo, Courage a Cowardly Dog, Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, Goosebumps, Over the Garden Wall. These are all examples of media for younger people and while they are all tonally different, they all still play with these darker concepts. And I like them all. I think they're all, I think they're all really neat. But what we see here in the content we're talking about today, it, it takes it a step further. It is the complete inverse. Instead of using horror elements for children's media, it's using children's media for horror. Having characters that don't typically fit in that media can elevate it for certain people by having that inherent juxtaposition. And it's juxtaposition that makes it easier for audiences to feel unsettled. Their familiarity with a concept is being turned on its head. There's a difference in feeling when I say bear eating a guy to uh, Winnie the Pooh eating a guy. Now what I'm saying is this making sense? Now this isn't just done by companies to profit off people. Of course here I gotta talk about fan fiction. A very popular format of creepypasta has to be the lost episode format. There's a couple of very popular ones based around Squidward and another one around The Simpsons. Hero Brian in Minecraft started as a creepypasta before being integrated into the game, kind of. There's a weird spooky Peppa Pig thing going on in Roblox. You, you get what I'm saying. All this is incredible popular so I think we can understand that there is definitely a market and attraction towards this content. Could it be interpreted as lazy? Yeah. Making a movie about insert popular character here kills other character here. It's not exactly a creative idea anymore but people are going to consume it and also it is an easy way to get attention. Again you're piggybacking off a concept that everyone is already familiar with. You don't need some kind of creative marketing campaign to get your horror character off the ground. There's already about a hundred years of brand knowledge and nostalgia to do that for you. Blood and Honey was a very small independent film and then in one trailer they got 12 million views. That is just completely from word of mouth. I don't mean to sound too critical here. I don't want you thinking that I went into these films with too many preconceived notions about how I would feel and the creator's intentions. As a fan of horror films and also as a fan of bad films, I went in really looking to enjoy these films. Spoilers ahead starting now, there's chapters in the video so just skip around if you want. Now as I said earlier, the first film that I watched for this video was Blood and Honey. Side note, I saw this on the free streaming service Broly. I had never heard of that before. Um, <laughs> great that there's so many streaming services out there for us all to enjoy. The most interesting part of this film for me was the introduction, which is a shame because there was so much more movie after this. It's done in this hand-drawn style, kind of reminiscent of the original work. And it tells a story of how Christopher Robin met these human-animal hybrids in the Hundred Acre Woods. Owl, Rabbit, Eeyore, Piglet, and of course Winnie the Pooh. But when Christopher Robin left for college, the animals were no longer getting fed and there was a really hard winter, so they had to eat Eeyore. And because they did this, they just go feral, and they vow to never speak again, and that they're gonna hate humanity, and it's all Christopher Robin's fault. And now they're just gonna kill and eat people, I guess. Christopher Robin comes back years later, and he brings with him his fiance. He wants to introduce her to his friends, but she doesn't believe that they exist. She believes that they were a childhood fantasy of his, which is, is crazy because he left when he was an adult, a full grown man. He went to college. Just have, have some faith in your partner here. They notice something strange and it kind of just accumulates with Pooh and Piglet killing this woman. This is where we get our first proper look at the characters. Now, while they do look very much just like people wearing masks, they are meant to be human animal hybrids. A lot of people watching the trailer just thought that they were meant to be dudes wearing masks. They're not. It's a small budget, okay? It's a small budget. I actually don't hate the look for Winnie the Pooh at all. I, I actually kind of like it. 
I think Piglet looks atrocious. He just comes across as a goofy guy. The mask, it just looks, it looks ridiculous on him. He looks stupid. Thank God they killed off Eeyore because I reckon he would be the hardest to adapt. He would just look like some kind of Bojack Horseman cosplayer. Anyway, they capture Christopher Robin and then we just move to a completely new unrelated cast of characters who we focus on for the rest of the film. A group of women decide to holiday to this nice house in the Hundred Acre Woods. Uh, where Winnie the Pooh and Piglet just kind of decide to kill them. It's not even to eat them, which I thought it would be. It's just because they're mean. It, they, they're just mean now. This movie as a whole is really slow and definitely not as fun of a premise as the title would imply. It really doesn't feel self-aware enough. Other than the introductory bit, there's no real reason for this to be a Winnie the Pooh story. Like, these characters could just be any old killers. Winnie the Pooh does occasionally eat honey mixed with blood in it, and at one point he does control bees to kill a guy, but that's kind of it. And because they don't talk, that removes any opportunity to do some of the classic lines. This is maybe, maybe the classic lines are, are still covered by copyright, I don't know. Again, for the most part, they're very generic killers uh, who just love tying people up. Winnie the Pooh is seen as an almost unstoppable force. At one point, he just like karate chops through a guy. Piglet's kind of useless. <laughs> Christopher Robin does show up kind of sporadically throughout the film. They mix his story in with the other people. But for some reason, they don't utilize him as a main character. He is definitely like a secondary character. It's really weird to use him as a side character considering he is the one with the emotional relationship with the murderers. The main focus is definitely on that group of women we talked about earlier, although I don't think they're very well fleshed out. One of them has some backstory that they had like a stalker. She's kind of the only one who's given any character. There's this one scene in the movie where it's just this woman alone in her room dancing around in her bikini and it serves absolutely no narrative purpose whatsoever. In the next scene, she's just in regular clothes. Every single character in this film also has the worst decision-making processes that I've ever seen in a horror film, which is saying something. Uh, for example, that woman from before ends up getting in the spa by herself in a later scene. And when she's taking pictures of herself, she notices the mutant creature of Winnie the Pooh standing in the background. And instead of getting out and leaving, she just goes, I hope you enjoy the show. I'm not going to let you ruin my my spa time, you know, and it's like, run away, get out of there, lady, D stay away from that guy. In short, this felt extremely rushed. I don't think much thought went into this at all. It feels like the script could have just been for any horror film, and then they shoved in that 13-minute bit at the beginning with Christopher Robin and just called it a day. Uh, but in saying all this, I didn't hate it. I think my brain is broken after I watched all those BuzzFeed films in a row. It's definitely a so bad, it's almost good kind of thing. It definitely makes for some good second monitor content. I wouldn't just straight up watch it alone by myself. That would be crazy. Also, why would you include characters like Owl and Rabbit in the intro and then not use them at all in the film. Uh, well, in the trailer for Blood and Honey 2, we do see that Owl and surprisingly Tigger are gonna be in the new one. Uh, so we've got that to look forward to. And also, they have definitely upped the budget. There's a whole new Winnie the Pooh costume. In my opinion, I, I think it looks worse. I, I really prefer the first one. But again, I am broken. But I definitely don't see this performing as well as the first one. I think kind of for most people, the novelty is gone. But the creator, after the success of the first film, as I said earlier, has talked about making a cinematic universe featuring all kinds of characters that are in the public domain, including Bambi and Peter Pan. And then recently, last month, he threw in the film Pinocchio unstrung into the mix. Could you imagine a horror film based around Pinocchio? Well, I could, because I watched it. Pinocchio's Revenge is a 1996 direct-to-video film based on the original Pinocchio story, which became public domain in 1940. So the idea of using these public domain characters for horror films isn't exactly a new thing. It's definitely more prevalent now. Uh, but also back then, there were less options for public domain characters to use. This film was actually created as more of a response to the trend of spooky doll horror films, that kind of whole creepy puppet genre. It's a response to child's play, which I'll talk about a little later on. It's one of those horror films that asks the age old question, could you beat a child in a fight? Big spoilers ahead for this straight to video film that you never heard of. This is going to be a more thorough breakdown because it's an older film and I don't feel as bad doing that. A man is found burying his murdered son and he is arrested. The police have evidence 
evidence that tied this man to several murders in the area. Also buried here is a little wooden marionette of Pinocchio, the titular character. The man's lawyer Jennifer is adamant that he is not the true killer and that he is hiding the identity of the real one. Who do you think the killer is? Hmm? Jennifer has a daughter named Zoe, a live-in babysitter named Sophia, and a new boyfriend named David. And those are all the characters you're gonna have to remember because her client ends up getting the electric chair. However, she still feels like something was wrong here. It takes about half an hour of this film for anything to happen with the puppet. She brings it home with her to, I guess, examine for e evidence? I don't remember, but she brings it home. And then at her daughter's birthday, there's some confusion and she's given the wooden doll as a present. And surprisingly, she freaking loves it. I guess the 90s were a different time. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, mommy, it's just a little puppet. They drop some spooky Pinocchio lore on her for some reason. I don't know why they do this. Feels weird to do to a kid with a new present. They tell her that Pinocchio was a bad dude, and that's why the blue fairy made his nose grow whenever he told a lie, and that's why he got a uh, cricket to be his moral conscience. Anyway, then Pinocchio starts pulling some weird shit. He watches the babysitter in the shower, which is a really long scene that I absolutely cannot show any of. He starts moving around on his own. The little girl starts sleeping with Pinocchio in her bed, which is extremely uncomfortable on two levels. Pinocchio then tears all her other toys apart in a jealous rage, and then also tries to kill one of her bullies at school. This puppet is getting out of hand. I can make David go away. What do you mean? Also, he talks now. Yeah, he, he talks. And he wants to make David go away. Getting rid of David would be a good thing. Same way punishing that bitch at school was a good thing. Alright, re relax. Jeez, relax, Pinocchio. That's too much. Slow down. Anyway, he slams a door in David's face and knocks him down the basement stairs, putting him in a critical state. She asks Pinocchio if he did it, and there's this cool effect where a car goes past outside and the shadow of Pinocchio's nose extends. Really freaking cool. I really like that. And then she goes outside to find a cricket to be his conscience. And this is where kind of parallels to the original Pinocchio story end. They really only do those three things. The growing of the nose, finding the cricket, and then he refers to becoming a real boy. Pinocchio then starts gaslighting this little girl to make her seem crazy in her therapy sessions. Now he thinks I heard David. Are you sure you didn't? If you weren't there, how can you be so sure it was me? Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up! And then Pinocchio convinces her that he wants to apologize to David, but the only way he can do that is if she cuts his strings so he can go to the hospital and tell him himself. So she does that and they take off into the night to go talk to David. And mysteriously, David's life support is cut off. So you may be thinking at this point, this film is called Pinocchio's Revenge. Who the hell is Pinocchio getting revenge on? And the answer is, I have no bloody idea. Jennifer gets the tragic news that David is dead, and she knows that her daughter snuck out last night because her pajamas were all muddy, so she confronts her. The little girl admits that she snuck out last night to go see David in the hospital, but she got lost and didn't make it there. But Pinocchio did. Jennifer is now suspecting her daughter, and she takes the action to lock Pinocchio in the boot of her car. Yeah, I'm sure that'll solve the problem. Don't worry, that's just the little girl, alright? That's not Pinocchio, it's just the little girl. She's protecting her mom from Pinocchio, it's okay. When talking to a priest, Jennifer theorizes that the killer at the beginning of the film wasn't the father, but it was the son. And maybe the father had to kill his own son to prevent any more deaths. Also, that maybe demons are real and they can possess objects and then convince people to kill other people. Meanwhile at home, the cricket has been squished! Oh no. And the babysitter gets beaten with a stick and apparently she dies from this. I'm pretty sure I can show this. This is not a gory film. Jennifer comes home and sees what's happened and then she's hit over the head. Pinocchio is real and he's nuts. So they have this big throw down and she literally throws him down through a table. And then big reveal number two, it actually was her daughter. The movie then cuts to her daughter in some kind of psychiatric hospital, but the mother is still adamant that what she saw was Pinocchio, not her daughter. But also she was hit in the freaking head, so it's kind of left up to audience interpretation whether she was just had a concussion or Pinocchio it was a real guy trying to 
kill people and maybe he possessed the girl. Overall, I think this was the best of the three films that I watched, but also probably it had the least to do with the original character. Like, there were a couple references to the original story, but that was it. So in that way, they were using the Pinocchio name in a very shallow way. But also, I guess the implication is that the demon was using Pinocchio's likeness and that the character of Pinocchio is also fictional in their world, kind of unlike Blood and Honey, where Blood and Honey, you could view it as a sequel to all the Winnie the Pooh stories. Now, this movie is kind of based around the original idea for the Child's Play movie. Originally, the doll in that film, the precursor to Chucky, was going to be acting out the main child's subconscious anger, and it was going to be very ambiguous to whether the doll was the killer or the kid was the killer. So, in that way, very similar to this movie. Pinocchio's Revenge also wasn't the original title of the film. Originally, it was going to be called Pinocchio Syndrome, which I think kind of gives it away a bit too much. Overall, yeah, not a good film, but I did enjoy it, and I do think it's the best of the three films. The final film I've looked at actually relates to the second lot of films that the creator of Blood and Honey wants to make. They've discussed making films about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Teletubbies, and Powerpuff Girls, which are all characters still under copyright. This is all a quote. I'm also interested in characters that are not in the public domain. With a larger budget, you can eventually buy the rights. We need to get the licenses for it, but that's something I'd like to dig into, see if we can get the licenses. I think it'd be really cool. Three super-powered mutant girls with a dad who puts them in a basement and experiments on them. Then we cut off their hands. They have stubs in the original series, so the idea was that their arms would be cut off. Uh, now, obviously, these films are never gonna freaking happen. The rights owners aren't just gonna hand out licenses to their characters because you have enough money. The perceived lasting impact to the brand would be incalculable. If only there was a way to get around this. Oh my goodness, there is. What? Of course I'm talking about parody, and I think the best way to discuss this is to watch a film that utilizes parody to depict a character that is not currently in the public domain. The mean one is a horror parody of Dr. Seuss's The Grinch, and I think out of all the films we've discussed, this is the one that utilizes the original content the best. In this movie, he is never explicitly called The Grinch, they call him The Mean One, which is a reference to that song, uh, You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch. Instead of the town being called Whoville, it's called New. And our main character isn't Cindy Lou, it's Cindy You Know Who. The film begins with her as a child and she catches the mean one trying to steal Christmas. She gives him a present, a necklace, which would have been the event to turn him good, you know, the whole his heart grew three sizes kind of thing. But what happens in this is her mother comes down the stairs and proceeds to beat the shit out of the Grinch. I mean the mean one, I meant the mean one, sorry. And during the scuffle, the mother falls head first onto a sharp object and dies, which kind of drives the mean one crazy and cements him as a monster. Years later, Cindy and her father return to the town to sell the house as a form of therapy. She's traumatized from the event, and because she was a child, the police didn't believe that a green creature came in and killed her mother. But they don't celebrate Christmas in this town anymore. They can't even buy decorations. Not because of Grinch reasons, though, because of other other reasons. But Cindy and her father find some old decorations in the attic and they, they decorate their house, which inadvertently summons the mean one to, at super speed, steal all the decorations and then kill her father. So now her whole family is dead to this creature and she still doesn't really know anything about it. A good thing she runs into Doc Zeus who offers explanation into some lore about the mean one. This film is very on the nose. There's lots of small references throughout the film, but it's never to the point where it implies that it's an official adaptation. One thing I think the film does really well is the characterization of the mean one. He does a lot of things seemingly inspired by the Jim Carrey version of the Grinch. Just the way he moves and all these man Mannerisms. It's not like Blood and Honey where these people could literally be anyone. He's very cartoonish with his actions. Again, he doesn't speak a lot. They definitely lean more into the idea that he's more monster than man now. And without spoiling too much in this, there's a lot of dialogue and plot points which I think are utilized in a really fun way. While I don't think this was a good movie by any means, it is a really fun watch. It definitely utilizes the character in a way where it makes sense that this film exists. Thought definitely went into it. It definitely makes films like Blood and Honey and Pinocchio's Revenge feel lazy in comparison. It is crazy to me that probably the best depiction of the character is in a film where they couldn't even use the character's name. What is it? Finch! Order from Mike Finch!
match. But yeah, it's obviously very low budget, but I, I had a lot of fun with it. Personally, I don't think we'll see any mainstream horror parody anytime soon. For a big studio, there's too much risk, considering that they can't even use the character's name, and it would probably sour relations with whoever does own the rights. But as more properties become public domain, and this is only going to accelerate over the next couple of years, we're definitely going to be seeing a lot of independent creators utilizing this. Considering the attention this kind of stuff gets, it would be crazy if that didn't happen. Also, horror can be done really well on a really low budget. And if sometimes you got to use a bigger character's name to get your get your movie off the ground, you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. I just hope that at some point these films are good. Honestly, though, I did have a lot of fun watching these films. Again, I do think my brain is broken. If you've watched any of these and enjoyed them, please let me know. Or if you hated them, also please let me know. What characters do you think would make for a good horror film? I do look forward to seeing what comes next. I think when maybe when all those Mickey Mouse films come out, maybe I'll make a video about that. Let me know if you'd be interested in seeing that. And if you would, you know, maybe subscribe if you got to this point in the video. Uh, thanks, thanks for watching my video out of all, all the videos out there. And if you like videos about bad horror films, maybe check out my video on Dear David. That is a horror film based around a series of tweets. Thanks. Thanks for watching.